Hey guys, Wayback Rewind here. A subscriber sent me their laser disc player to evaluate. I've never owned one of these and it's been decades since I've even seen one. They are widely regarded as failures, but I wanted to take a look at it and see if, with the benefit of hindsight, if it makes any sense at all, and look at some of its features and basically see where LaserDisc falls on the spectrum of home video. So we're gonna take a look at this here on Wayback Rewind. So today I have one of the late model examples of a LaserDisc player. LaserDisc was a format that came out in 1978, came out just a couple of years after VHS and Beta. It never competed head to head with video recorders and mainly because they don't record. That was a big hit on this format. People were comparing them to VHS and Beta. It almost didn't make sense. Idea that you could buy a movie and own it in your home was not even an idea that had been thought of. Like most products, VHS and Beta was an answer to a problem. Television before 1975 was very different than how we watch television today. Back then, a TV program came on once, and if you missed it, you just missed it. And in 1975, when home video became a thing, when VCRs came, hit the market, there were lots of different formats. You know, I'm not gonna get into the format wars here, but basically for the first time ever, people could record a program and watch it later. That was called time shifting. Time shifting was the primary reason why VCRs were marketed. The idea that you would rent or buy a movie had not even been thought of. In fact, in 1982, the head of the Motion Picture Association of America went before the American Congress and testified that the VCR was going to destroy the movie industry. And they wanted Congress, if not to ban them outright, to put a heavy tax on them with the tax money going to the MPAA. I don't think I have to tell you that didn't happen. And I can't tell you exactly when they pivoted, but at some point the MPAA realized that their vast catalog of movies represented a revenue stream. And it wasn't until probably a decade after the introduction of the VCR that the idea of Blockbuster came about and renting and selling movies became a thing. And it was in this later half of the home video revolution that LaserDisc kind of came into its own. As a marketing failure or success, it, it only reached about 2% market penetration in the US. And so I never took a marketing class, but that's probably considered a failure. In the mid 90s, LaserDisc kind of had a renaissance. People that wanted higher quality home video than you can get on VHS bought these machines because they could get movies in relatively high quality compared to VHS of the time. So a friend of mine sent over a bunch of movies along with this player. The movies, some of the movies were classics like Star Wars, I call that a classic, but uh, some of these also are from the mid 90s, which were contemporary movies at the time this machine was made. And so one of the things about LaserDisc that's interesting to me, it was the first mass marketed optical media player for the home market. You know, this was several years before CD, probably a decade before DVD. And so this was the first time that consumers had access to an optical media. And so it's this weird combination of technologies that's, that's fascinating today. If you look at the disc, it's roughly the size of an LP. It's just about a half a centimeter under 12 inches. It has this weird hole in the middle, the size of a 45. So it's this weird mashup of LP and 45. The light catches it just right. You can actually see grooves on it. And speaking of grooves, this is an analog video format. I'm gonna put this in here just so I don't have to keep holding it. The later models were front loaders like this. Since they overlapped the CD and even some of the later models overlapped DVD, these machines could play just about any type of optical media, which made them semi-popular in the later half of the, of the 90s, even though they never reached the popularity that most people would consider a success. 
for late 70s technology, they did have some advantages. The idea that you could randomly access chapters was a new thing for people at, in that era. Compared to a tape, you didn't have to rewind it. You didn't have to fast forward it. You could go immediately to the chapter that you wanted. Some of these machines, you can actually even go to the specific frame that you want to go to, which most VCRs can't even do that. I don't even know if DVDs can do that, although there might be some, but for the most part, DVDs don't have frame accurate access. So that was a pretty advanced feature for 1978. The other thing, these machines have, you know, physical controls on them where you can hit rewind, fast forward and play. They will obey your command no matter how you command it, which is kind of different from DVD. For example, DVD, you can't skip over the FBI warning. There are certain times that a DVD will not do what you want it to do. This machine will always obey your commands. You hit play or you hit stop, it will always obey your command. Now you can hear this thing spinning up. The disc actually weighs a lot compared to an LP. It has an aluminum core with two plastic sides on it. As I was indicating, the video is analog. It, it was always analog from the beginning all the way to the end. The problem with that is uncompressed analog video takes up a lot of space. These discs actually hold about the same amount of digital data as a DVD. Now, granted, they're bigger and they're double-sided. They will hold several gigabytes of data, which was a lot for the 70s. But putting analog uncompressed video on there took up a lot of space. So depending on how it was recorded, these discs could hold anywhere from 30 minutes. I think they could hold up to an hour on one side in certain modes. Most movies are over an hour, so you would have to flip it over. Some of the later machines like this, you could actually push a button and the reading mechanism itself would flip over instead of the disc needing flipping. But there's a pause there. I didn't time that, but it took several seconds for it to the mechanism to flip over. So there's a, a little bit of a break there. And if your movie goes over two hours, you're going to definitely need more than one disc. This Jurassic Park, there are actually two discs in here. So you can see I put in side one and side two. And this is side three and side four. So the drawback to this format compared to VHS, you're going to need a lot of handling of the media just to watch a movie. This one will automatically flip over, but at some point I'm going to need to put in another disc. This one is letterboxed. In the 90s, people started getting an appreciation for the widescreen format. Unfortunately, letterboxing is really just cropping, so you're losing some of that resolution that you would normally get on here. But VHS tapes were letterboxed as well, so that really, that's not really a discriminator. It's not really an indictment of the format. I mean, television of those times, most people did not have widescreen TVs in the mid-90s. So letterboxing was a nice compromise to be able to see the movie in the original aspect ratio, or at least closer to the aspect ratio than it was in the theater. But for a, a late 70s technology, this was pretty advanced. There is a lot of momentum in that spinning disc. It spins at 1800 RPM. You can hear it slowing down. And putting the brakes on. I'm not even sure it has brakes. It feels like it's taking a while to slow down. It's still trying to open. Any day now, it's going to try to open. Wow. That took a while. <laughs> yeah. So, spinning down this disc and, put, and putting in the other disc, you know, your movie experience is going to have a several minute break. I guess you could give everyone a potty break or make some popcorn or do something, but you are going to lose some time flipping this disc, changing to the other disc. But what I wanted to show you is this machine has a direct CD function. Given that CDs overlap the, the time span that these machines were made, you could go to a direct CD format. And when you press open close, it sends out this little disc, which is kind of a convenient thing. This is actually a DVD, but I have maybe in my collection somewhere one small audio CD. But I'm just going to put this in here just to demonstrate how you could even play a mini CD. So these machines of the 
mid 90s were kind of versatile that you could play just about any optical media that existed at the time and some of the later models as i indicated actually had dvd players built into them and some of them even had carousels where you could play multiple cds as a format they tried to accommodate just about anything that you could want to do in an optical media format to get my my big tray back i have to send that back in then press direct cd open it back up we're going to spin this baby up back up just to see how that looks again It actually spins up quite a bit faster than it slows down. I'm going to put my microphone over here just so you can hear that. All right, let's let's hear this thing spin up again because that's kind of a neat sound. I'm just going to be quiet so you can hear it spin up. Yes, it definitely spins up quicker than it slows down. I think maybe there was some brake pads in there that have kind of worn out because I can't believe that it would take that long to slow down. So you do have a forward and reverse scan. Some of the early machines didn't really have that capability. They added that to some of the later machines. The machines that were recorded in constant angular velocity could do that right out of the gate. The chapter access is kind of neat. For people of the late 70s, being able to go directly to a chapter was an almost unheard of luxury. Being able to go directly to the chapter you want, it was just like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe you're allowing me to do that. You actually have a forward and reverse scan. I'm going to show you what that looks like. So I've got the movie up here on the screen. It's a letterbox movie, so I was able to put my TV into cinema mode and fill up the entire 69 screen. By today's standards, it's not quite as good as DVD, but for late 70s technology, analog video, it's actually pretty good. Certainly better than VHS. Oh, I do have this movie somewhere in a box in the closet in VHS. I was going to do an AB comparison, but I think that's kind of pointless. I know from the specs, the, the, it has about double the video resolution and bandwidth of VHS. It's kind of hard to compare analog formats, but the quality is clearly better than VHS, but that's not really what this was about. VHS, as I said, was, was all about time shifting. It wasn't until later in its lifespan that the MPAA got on board and they started putting their catalog out on tapes, but video files continually wanted this format over VHS. They did not want to build up a big collection of tapes. They wanted laser discs because these could be played indefinitely, although laser rot became a thing. But theoretically, these discs could be played indefinitely because there's no physical contact between the disc and the playing mechanism, similar to CD and DVD and Blu-ray that came afterwards. From a historical perspective, I can easily say that this machine is like the grandfather to DVD. DVD literally does everything that this does and better. It, DVD is digital and DVD has compression in PEG2 and so it can fit considerably more video onto that disc than Laserdisc could ever hope to even with a disc with considerably more real estate on it. Scanning through this it's not quite as smooth a scan as we would expect today but it can do it. Let's check out the pause. The pause is basically non-existent. Some machines would have a digital memory in there that could actually store a frame. This one literally does not. The scan is not very quick. That's, that's as much as I have. I can't go any faster. But it is a bright and clear image, relatively sharp on a small screen like this. If I were watching this on a 50 inch screen or larger, it would start to 
show some of its limitations. It would be a little fuzzy. But for late 70s technology, it's not bad. So let's talk about whether this was a failure or not. Given that they were trying to create something that didn't exist, they were trying to create an environment where people would want to buy and own movies. I personally was never the type of person to want to own a movie. I bought VCRs because I could record things and time shift them and watch programs when I wanted to. And I had a camera. I could record my own home video. Owning movies to me is just not something I want to do. Those movies will exist in libraries and catalogs for now and forevermore. And the people that, like my friend that bought this on Laserdisc, they bought it again on DVD and they, and they probably bought it again on Blu-ray or they probably bought it on iTunes. And, and so you end up buying the same movie six times over. The movie studios love for you to buy these over and over and over. And I'm sure these movies have been released more times than I can remember. For the folks that wanted the highest quality movie, this was the format to have in the late 70s all the way up through the, the mid 90s. These machines were made and movies were actually released on Laserdisc all the way through 2001. So it overlapped the DVD period pretty substantially. I wouldn't mind getting one of these machines that can play DVDs just as a curiosity, if nothing else. Uh, but just something that was sort of like a Rosetta Stone that could play every type of optical format in existence would be kind of cool to have. This one can play the CDs as I showed you earlier. But other than that, was it a failure? 2% market penetration I think speaks for itself. It was a super highly niched product. It was a little more popular in Japan from what I'm told. 10% market penetration. But this format is highly obscure in the rest of the world. Almost unheard of in Europe and other parts of Asia. So as a, as a marketing success, it was not. Technology wise, being able to put hours of uncompressed analog video onto an optical disc, it was a triumph. It took longer than it probably should have. Had these discs come out in the early 70s before the VCR, uh, they would have had the whole market to themselves if the movie studios had not fought all the technology the way they did. They, you know, ever since television came around in the 50s, the movie studios have said that these technologies will destroy the movie industry. The movie industry has shown itself to be very resilient. All of the t home technologies, none of them have really threatened the movie industry very much. Even the pandemic, when people were staying home and streaming movies, uh, when the pandemic more or less subsided the movie industry bounced back pretty quickly and so we, what we're seeing here is another example of where the motion picture association of america and i don't know about in other countries but mpaa fought every form of home video technology until they finally embraced it and discovered that these were revenue streams and they could sell these movies time and time again as i indicated earlier so this is laserdisc a success or a failure it's up to you to decide I personally never wanted one because I'm not a movie collector but if you are a movie collector some people even today think that the analog video looks better than the digital artifacts of DVD and you could argue about blu-ray and the higher resolution formats but if I were to compare this to a DVD of the same era some people would argue this is better and so there you have it. This is Laserdisc. As always, like or subscribe to my channel. And thanks for watching.